All right, how's it going? Welcome back to another video for Linear Algebra. I am excited to be making this video, partially because we have moved on to a new section, going from complex numbers into vectors, but also because the, the section on complex numbers was really just so we could say that we've seen complex numbers at some point. So that way, whether it's in this video series or some later video series, if we see the number i, we aren't asking ourselves what this thing is. We know that it is the square root of negative one, right? And that was really one of the main ideas for, for why we were talking about complex numbers. And you could also make the case too that it, a complex number could be visually represented as an arrow in two dimensional space on an argon diagram and how that visual representation is analogous to how we can visually think of a two-dimensional vector or a, a vector in two-dimensional space that is so there are these slight connections that that can be made to linear algebra when talking about complex numbers but really the first actual video on linear algebra topics is, is going to be this one and and that's why i'm excited because it feels kind of like a lecture one in that sense so what, what are we going to be talking about then in this video? Well, first, I want to, to talk about the phrase linear algebra as a mathematical subject. Uh, where does it fit in with the overall area, or the overall, um, I guess, map of mathematics? So that's going to be the first goal, understanding where, where the, the place of linear algebra falls. And then second, once we understand where linear algebra fits in to everything else, we're going to see that linear algebra is about the study of a certain algebraic object and certain types of maps between that algebraic object. And I'm being very vague uh, purposefully, but if you have seen the title of this video, you might have a hint for what that algebraic object is called. It turns out it is called a vector space. So the second main goal of this video is to introduce what that object is, is to introduce what a vector space is, as well as some of the properties that its elements, called vectors, need to satisfy. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, first, first main goal is, is what is this thing, linear algebra, basically? And I want to do this too because when I first took my first linear algebra course in, in undergrad, I had not taken an algebra course prior to that outside of the elementary algebra that we learn in middle school and high school. So, so going into my first linear algebra class, I'm, I'm looking at the title linear algebra. I say, all right, linear algebra, this, this looks like the algebra of lines. So I, I literally went into my first linear algebra class thinking I was going to learn a bunch of stuff about lines. And maybe I wasn't 100% wrong, but that's definitely not what, what linear algebra is really about. So linear algebra is a specific area of sort of a, a umbrella term called modern algebra. And modern algebra is a slightly different viewpoint or looks at algebra from a slightly different viewpoint than elementary algebra. In elementary algebra, and when I refer to elementary algebra too, I, I refer to the, the algebra that we've learned in middle school and high school. But in elementary algebra, I would say that a good way of describing it is we learn about vari or we start introducing variables in our equations. So we don't no longer we don't only have numbers, right? We start to introduce x and y and stuff like that. And then we can start to produce equations that might have meanings, like the slope intercept form of a line. And introductory algebra is a lot about being able to take various uh, symbols or to take variables and to perform manipulations on them within equations. And I would say that's probably a pretty good one sentence summary about what uh, elementary algebra is. But that is a slightly different uh, way of thinking about algebra compared to modern algebra or abstract algebra. And, and, and I, I tend to not like to use the phrase abstract algebra uh, because abstract is very subjective, right? What is abstract to one person may be completely intuitive to another person. And abstract kind of sounds intimidating. 
So I typically like to refer to it as modern algebra, but you'll, you'll hear both modern and abstract algebra. But regardless, uh, modern algebra is really about the study of these things called algebraic structures. And it turns out that there are different algebraic structures that show up. And depending on what area of modern algebra you are studying, you may be interested in different types of algebraic structures. One of the video series on this channel is called Group Theory. And Group Theory is essentially the study of the algebraic structure called the group. And just to quickly, very quickly describe what that is, if I were to write out a this, this word group, in, in math, the, the algebraic structure called the group is a pair of two things, where the first is the first thing in the pair is a set, which we'll call G, and the second thing is some binary operation, which we can call star. And if you have this pair of a set and a binary operation together that, that satisfy a list of axioms, you get an algebraic structure called a group. And that entire video series is dedicated to understanding uh, what these things are, what this type of algebraic structure is. But it turns out that groups are not the only algebraic structure out there. There is another type of algebraic structure that uh, is called a ring. Maybe I'll write this over here. A ring. And a ring is a collection of, of typically three different things, where the first is a set, which I'll call R for ring. And then the second and third are two different elements, or I should say two different uh, binary operations which typically get referred to as uh, addition and multiplication, even though that's, uh, the, these are not, the, these are more generalized, I should say, than just addition and multiplication. But the basic idea is that you have a set and two operations compared to a set and one operation. And also some of the axioms of a ring are going to be inherently different from the axioms of a group. So there are these different algebraic structures and within looking at rings, if we are only interested in looking at rings, there are these special types of rings that, uh, that have basically a multiplicative inverse element for every element that is non-zero. And, and this is not going to be true for an arbitrary ring. Uh, an arbitrary ring will always have an additive inverse, but, but its elements may or may not have a multiplicative inverse. And in the case where you have a ring, where essentially every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse, that ring is given a special name, and that it's called a field. Okay, so maybe I'll just, if this is a, a ring, maybe I'll put sort of a subset of this. So we have this thing called a field. Right. So we're learning about the, or just at least hearing that there are these different algebraic structures out there. And, and we can keep going too. And, and there's a reason for why I'm going through all this. In addition to talking about groups, rings, fields, another type of algebraic object that's out there is called a module. And a module, let me, let me just write the, the term module. A module typically isn't even referred to just as a module by itself. It's typically referred to in the most general sense as an R module. And the reason why it's referred to as an R module is because you need a ring denoted by the letter R typically in order to produce a module. A module inherently requires that a ring is already defined in order to create a module in the first place. Okay. So, so it's, it seems like, like we're things slowly build off of each other. We have, we have groups, and then if we add an additional uh, binary operation, have a slightly different set of axioms, we get this thing called a ring. Special case of a ring is a field, and then uh, a ring can get used to produce this new object called a module. And in the case where a module is not produced by just a ring, but is produced by the special type of ring being a field, then we no longer get an R module, but we get a term called a vector space. Okay, so a vector space, let me write this down here. 
is the special case of a module that is generated by a field rather than an arbitrary ring. All right. And what linear algebra is really about is, is it is about under looking and studying the algebraic object of the vector space, or probably more specifically for, for this course, finite dimensional vector spaces, and also the, uh, the linear maps between them. In other words, you, when we first learn about functions, we can describe a function f going from a to b as a map from one set into another. But we can also have functions mapped from different types of algebraic objects into other different types of algebraic objects. And what linear algebra is, is interested in is not just learning about this thing called the vector space, but it's learning about functions which map from one vector space into another. And uh, even more specifically, we are not just interested in any function which maps from one vector space into another vector space, but we are interested in special types of functions called linear functions, linear functions or linear maps. These are functions that satisfy a very specific property. The phrase linear does not mean a line, but it means that, well, we will get to it at some point in this video series. But, but just know that the phrase linear has a very specific concrete meaning and only certain functions happen to be linear functions. So what linear algebra is about, to, to summarize this, is that it is the study of the algebraic object called the vector space and the, or I guess the finite dimensional vector space for what we're gonna be working with and the linear maps between vector spaces. Okay. If this all sounds very, very confusing right now, that's okay. The, the idea here is not to get a, a perfect understanding of what any of these objects are that are listed here on the board but rather just to say that out of all of these different objects that could potentially show up in the field of modern algebra, and there are additional ones beyond these too, that this is the context, this thing that I circled right here, this is the context of what, where this video series is going to be interested in. It's going to be interested in studying these, uh, I guess this realm of modern algebra. Okay, so, um, Hopefully, at least in terms of the context of things, we can see how linear algebra fits into one piece of the overall puzzle for just the umbrella term of modern algebra or abstract algebra. Okay. So, yeah, hopefully this, this at least gives us some idea of what's going on. But what, what, I, what I really want to do in, in this video is not just to say that linear algebra is the act of uh, learning about these things called vector spaces and the linear maps between them, but also to, to say, okay, well, if we're interested in learning about vector spaces, what is a vector space, right? That's, that's a perfectly reasonable question to, to ask. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to erase the board. I'm going to write out the definition of what a vector space is, and then that's what we're going to really spend the majority of this video unpacking. All right, so we have this rather extensive but still complete definition for what a vector space is. And what I wanna do for the rest of this video is to first unpack this definition, and you can see it's a lot, right? But then also to make sure that we have both an understanding of the definition for vectors in the vector space, but then also an intuition for vectors in the vector space. Because both our intuition and the definition of what a vector is and what a vector space is. Those are both very important, but we want to make the distinction that they are separate things. How we visualize or how we intuitively think of a vector 
is different, or often different, I should say, from the mathematical definition of a vector itself. So I wanna really make sure that we emphasize that distinction early on. But first things first, let's just go through this definition for what a vector space is. So it says a vector space, uppercase V, over a field is a collection of vectors, little v in the vector space, big V, together with two operations, vector addition and, and scalar multiplication. And before we jump into anything down here, I want to make sure that we understand this top part of the sentence, or the top part of the definition, because there's a lot to unpack just there alone. And when we try to unpack what the, the definition of a vector space is, and, and when we try to understand what it is, I wanna emphasize that by trying to understand a vector space, what we are really trying to do is we are trying to understand its elements and how its elements interact, okay? So those are gonna be the two things that we are interested in learning about. What are the elements of a vector space and how do they interact? Because you can imagine if we were working with a set, right? And maybe I have like a, a set and we visually imagine the set as a box and then we put a bunch of elements in our set. If somebody were to ask you to examine or, or to understand what this set is, we would probably try to just lift off the cover from the box and, and see what's inside. Look at what the elements are for the set. Same idea is gonna apply with the vector space. We wanna see what the elements are to understand the actual vector space itself. So to answer the first question, what are the elements of a vector space? That part is right here in the definition. A vector space is a collection of vectors. So elements of a vector space are called individual vectors. And notation-wise, we can denote a vector by a lowercase, uh, a lowercase letter from the English alphabet where there is sort of this half arrow over the, the top of that letter. So this would read the vector V is an element of the vector space, uppercase V. Okay. So that's what its elements are. Its elements are called vectors. All right. So, so hopefully uh, we're like, okay, sure. But now how, how do these elements interact? And it says that the elements are going to be able to interact by the operations that are equipped to the vector space. And with a vector space, there are two operations. In other words, two different ways that elements or vectors can interact. The first is through vector addition, and the second is through scalar multiplication. So let's make sure we understand what those are. And what you might have noticed is that I, I have, up until this point, skipped over the, the field part of this definition. We are not going to go into detail for what a field is, but for this, the purpose of this video series, every time we talk about a field, if we even talk about it, we should just assume I'm talking about the set of real numbers or the set of complex numbers. So um, that, that is exactly what I think of when I think of a field, uh, intuitively at least, and, and that's how, how you should as well, at least for the purpose of uh, this video series. Okay. So, so uh, that is how we should think of a field and I should mention that elements of a field are called scalars. So elements of the vector space are called vectors, elements of the field are called scalars. Now, the actual vector space itself is V, and maybe, maybe I should write this real quick. The actual vector space is V with the first operation, vector addition, and the second operation, scalar multiplication. So when we talk about the elements, we're talking about the vectors. And, and what we want to do now is to say, okay, how do these vectors interact? And with this first operation, vectors can interact with other vectors through vector addition. Through the second operation, vectors can also interact with scalars or real numbers or complex numbers. And how do, they, how, how do vectors interact with scalars? Through scalar multiplication. These are the two different ways that vectors can interact, either with other vectors or with scalars. Now we might say, okay, sure, that, that's how the vectors, um, or the elements of a vector space interact. 
But what are the specifics of that? What does it mean to have vector addition and scalar multiplication? And that's what, what this list is right here. So starting with the vector addition operation, what is, it, what is required when two vectors interact with each other through this vector addition operation? And there are four properties. The first is that we must have commutativity. So in other words, if A and B are vectors, and again, we know that they are vectors because they have this half arrow over the top of them, the order in which we add two vectors should not matter. In other words, A plus B is the same as B plus A. Okay. The second is associativity. If we have three vectors now, A, B, and C, the order in which we apply vector addition should also not matter. We can first add B and C together, and then A afterwards. Or we can add A and B together first, and then C afterwards. And the final result should be the same thing. So vector addition needs to be both commutative and associative. The third property is that there needs to be an identity element, which is the, which we can typically denote notation-wise as the zero vector. And the zero vector is, is gonna be any vector such that if we add the zero vector to some other vector A, and we take A plus zero or zero plus A, we get A. The, the, the fact that we're calling this an identity element, another way of thinking of this identity element is like the do nothing element. Um, it, it is the element that when we apply vector addition to it, it has the effect of just not impacting the other input at all. Okay. And then the final requirement is the notion of an inverse element. For every vector in the vector space A, there needs to be a corresponding inverse element Called, which we can call negative A, such that when we apply vector addition to an element and its inverse, we get back to the identity. A compact way of saying this is that uh, a vector space needs to form an abelian group under vector addition. If a lot of this sounds complicated, um, first I, I understand, <laughs> uh, but don't worry, at the end too, I'm going to summarize what we should know out of all this. I'm, I'm saying all this now to be complete, but I will summarize this in like two, two or three sentences to, to get the main points at the end. And then we're gonna go through an example to make sure that we understand what's going on. But basically, vectors can interact with other vectors through vector addition, and these four properties would need to be satisfied if they, they interact. Now, what, what about the other case? What if we wanna have vectors interacting with scalars or elements from this field? like real numbers or complex numbers. Well, then scalar multiplication must satisfy these four properties right here. And throughout this video series, we're going to refer to a scalar typically as a Greek letter without an arrow on the top of it. And that's going to help us distinguish in two different ways that scalars are different than vectors. So here we see that A and B are vectors because they have the arrow over the top. And then this is the Greek letter lambda, and lambda is a scalar, so it does not have the half arrow over the top of it. Okay. And basically what the, the first two properties of scalar multiplication say is that we can distribute a real number across a sum of two vectors and how we would, stand, how we would typically distribute uh, a number across parentheses. And then the second property is kind of just the reverse case. If we are adding two scalars together, then we can distribute a vector into both cases. So lambda and mu are both scalars, and we can distribute a into here to get lambda a, and then we can distribute a into here to get plus mu times a. All right. So the standard distributive properties that we're familiar with need to hold, they need to be satisfied. Then for the third property, scalar multiplication needs to be associative. In other words, if I am applying scalar multiplication twice, the order in which I apply it should not matter. So if I apply mu times a and then lambda, that should be the same as multiplying the two scalars, take that result and then multiply that by the vector a. And then finally, there should be some sort of notion of an identity scalar, which we're gonna call the number one, where if we think of this as the real numbers, this is the number one. One times anything is just gonna be itself.
So this is the <laughs> rather long list of uh, all the properties that are required for a vector space. Now, how do we remember any of this, right? And, and the, the concise way to remember this is, is probably the following couple of statements. Uh, a vector space is going to be a set with two operations, addition and vector addition and scalar multiplication. Elements of the vector space are called vectors. And vectors, when we, when we are asked what the definition of a vector is, the definition of a vector is anything that can be added to other vectors and multiplied by scalars. Or in other words, if I were to write out the definition of a vector, a vector is anything that can be added and scaled. That is the main idea, like the nutshell within a nutshell of all of this. Okay. So any set where elements can be added and then scaled by elements of a field, that, that would constitute a, a vector space. There's a lot going on. I, I hope the main idea that makes sense and that vectors can only vectors are things that can be added and scaled. What I want, what I really want to do though, is I want to erase the board so we can get rid of this long definition. Go through an example to, to really help make this more concrete. So I'm going to erase the board and then we're going to do that now. All right, so now to get rid of a lot of that general abstractness and to go through a concrete example. And I should mention too that this is not just going to be an arbitrary example. This is gonna be one of the most common examples we'll be working with throughout the entire video series. And, and when I say that too, I really mean that one of the most common examples uh, is, is Rn, but to start and at least to draw out visually to gain an intuition for what a vector space is, we're gonna start with R2. So let's first just remind ourselves what R, R2 is. It is the set of essentially ordered pairs where, let's see, we can say that R2 is the set of ordered pairs where both A and B are um, real numbers. All right, so I'm going to say A and B in R. And the important thing too here is that, that these ordered pairs have, have well, an order to them. A needs to be first and B needs to be second. And that's different than if B is first and A is second. Right? If we were working with R3, then we would just have a list of A, B, and C. If we were working with Rn, we would have A, B all the way through however big N is, right? And so, so this is what, what R2 is, and maybe I should also say it's, it's simply the, the Cartesian product, R cross R. But if we want to represent, and this is how we should, uh, and we're often going to do this throughout the, the course, is if we want to represent an element of this vector space, so in other words, if we want to represent a vector in R2, the way that we can do that is by writing this ordered pair right here as a set of vertical brackets where the first component is on top and the second component is on the bottom. So a representation of a vector in R2, and maybe I'll call it, um, I don't know, I can call it little v, is going to be denoted with this notation right here where A represents the first component and B represents the second component. All right. um, so this is, at least notation-wise, how we can denote a vector in R2. But let's see how we can actually intuitively think of these vectors. So I want to go through very specific examples with concrete numbers. Let me say that I have a vector V1, and maybe that vector is, I don't know, 3, 1. And then I have another vector V2, which maybe is one, two. And I want to see what, how to manipulate these vectors. These are elements of a vector space. So then we say, okay, how do I manipulate these? Well, we just go back to how a vector space is defined. A vector space is a collection of vectors and vectors can be added to other vectors or scaled by scalars, multiplied by scalars. 
So let's first take the case where we want to add two vectors together. How would we do that and what would that look like visually? So let's first do this algebraically where we want to take two vectors v1, or I want to take a vector v1 and add it to another vector v2, like this. What that can correspond to is, is taking these sort of columns that I have right here and just adding up the, the light components. So I'm going to have 3, 1 plus 1, 2. And the way this is going to work is the, the top component here is going to add to the top component here to give 4, and then same thing with the bottom component to give 3. So this is going to produce a resulting vector for 3, and that's what v1 plus v2 would equal. So this is how we can add um, vectors, at least in R2. And you can imagine if we had n different components, we would just add up each of the n uh, components by, by how they're ordered. So that's how we can perform vector addition in R2 and, and really Rn. Uh, how can we visually represent this? And this is what I, I'm, I would like to get at. So to, to visually represent this, we can start with our vector v1 and to just draw it on this, this coordinate plane that we have right here. The top number in the column is going to represent the x-axis, and that's 3, so I'm going to just go over 1, 2, 3. And then the bottom coordinate is going to represent the y-axis, which is going up 1. So that would go up 1 like this. That would represent this dot right here. And then we can visually think of a vector as an arrow in space. So we can visually think of v1 like this. We could also do the same thing with v2 by itself. We could say that v2 is 1 in this direction and 2 in the, the vertical direction. But what if, and this is how we could draw any singular vector or any individual vector in our vector space, r2. Maybe just to, to make sure we're absolutely clear, if this was R3, we would have to draw a three-dimensional space. Since this is Rn, we would not be able to draw an n-dimensional space. But because we're able to draw a two-dimensional space, that's why we're working with R2. Now, how do I draw the resulting vector V1 plus V2? Well, if, if I started with V1, that takes me to this point. But I would like to ideally get to this resulting vector, 4, 3. I can ask myself, how far would I need to go from this point in order to get to the vector, 4, 3? And say, okay, well, I'm already at 3, 1. So then come over here. I, I need to, if I want to get to 4 on the x-axis, I need to move 1 over. So I need to go over here. And then in order to go up to the point 3, I need to move up 2. So maybe I'm going to... Just go up two like this, and then the resulting vector, and let, let me make this a little bit more clear. First vector is v1. This new point right here, that's what 4, 3 is, the vector 4, 3. So I can also draw out an arrow in space corresponding to 4, 3. In other words, I could draw out, whoops, I, I missed, the, missed the dot there. <laughs> I can draw out an arrow in space going up to this point 4, 3, and this arrow right here, which is different than the bottom one, this would be v vector v1 plus v2. Okay. Now, how what is another way of being able to construct this arrow right here? Notice we haven't drawn v2 by itself. And while we could draw v2 by itself, the vector 1, 2, by drawing it going 1 to the right and upwards by 2. Notice that once we start, once we stopped off at v1, in other words, once we stopped off with these values, we say, okay, what do we need to add from v2 in order to get to our final answer of 4, 3? So we started, so we went from here to here. This was our stopping point after v1. And then we went from here to here where this was v2. So here's what I, I am trying to get at. That conceptually, we can, or intuitively, we can think of a vector as an arrow in space, and the way that we can perform vector addition visually or intuitively is by 
first drawing the, the first vector from the origin to wherever it stops at. And then for the second vector, have its starting point be the same place as the stopping point of the first vector. Notice I could have also drawn V1 like this. I could have drawn V2 like this. And if I just drew those two arrows alone, going from uh, the, the tip to the tail, then I could have just said, all right, I have one, two, and then I can draw the resulting sum as a line going from the origin to the final point right there. So this is how we can visually imagine adding two vectors together. Okay, hopefully this makes sense. Now, what if I wanted to subtract two vectors? Is that even allowed in a vector space? Because after all, we, could, we said that vectors, we could only perform vector addition and scalar multiplication. So can we subtract two vectors? And the answer is yes, we, we, we can subtract two vectors, but we have to do it in the context of addition. So the, the way we do that is we add a negative to the, the vector that we're looking at. So let's say that we want to take V1 minus V2, and maybe I'll write this down here. V1 minus V2. First, let's just do it algebraically. Well, like, let's see what the actual column vectors, what these columns look like. So this would be 3, 1, minus 1, 2. And this should equal... 3 minus 1 is 2, 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So that should bring me to the vector 2, negative 1. Now, that's how we should be able to do this algebraically, uh, but how can we actually think of this in terms of uh, vector addition? Well, the way that we can think of this is we can essentially just put parentheses around this minus v2. We can say that this is the vector v1 plus the negative vector v2. We know that this exists because from the axioms of the vector space, every vector has a corresponding inverse denoted with the negative. Okay. So we might say, all right, that's, that's how we can subtract two vectors in the way that we imagine <laughs> subtracting two vectors. What does that look like though on this diagram right here? And same, we can apply kind of the same principle. We're gonna start with V1, which we've already drawn out. But I also want to draw out now this vector v1 minus v2, which is 2 to the right and 1 going down. So if I go 2 to the right, that's going to go 1, 2. And then if I go down 1, that's going to bring me down here. So this vector going from the origin out to this point, this vector would be v1, um, v1 minus v2. Now, we might, we might want to ask, how can we construct, or, or how can we imagine drawing out V2 with, with what we have so far? Because hopefully we remember that in order to, to, to add two vectors, we, we went from the, the tail to the tip, and then the tip to the tail uh, with, with, e with each vector that we were adding. So the starting point of the next vector uh, was where the previous vector left off. And we were able to add vectors like this. So the, the way that we can do this is, is by applying that same principle of tip to tail, but just with sort of the, the negative, the negative vector V2. So if we think of this as, uh, as um, the inverse of, of V2 or the negative of it, we ask, okay, what's the negative of V2? And the negative of V2 is just when each of the components are negative. You say, okay, well, well now let's just add tip to tail this vector to my starting vector V1. And I'd say, okay, well, I need to go one to the left and then two downwards. And this vector right here would be negative V2. So kind of uh, an interesting amount of, of things going on here, but, but hopefully it makes sense that we can subtract two vectors and we can th think of it visually as adding just the negative of a vector. And this, this allows us also to just interpret what the negative of a vector is. If we just added a negative sign to whatever the vector is, 
what that corresponds to visually in our head is just reversing the arrow, the, or reversing the direction of the arrow that, that um, we're looking at. So if we had an arrow that was pointing up like this, the, the negative of this vector would be the, the same, would have the same length, but just pointing in the opposite direction like this. So intuitively, visually, that's how we can think of the negative of a vector, just an arrow pointing in the opposite direction. So hopefully these ideas make sense so far. This is all for vector addition. Now let's say, for example, that I have another vector, I'll call it V3, and maybe I'll write it down here. V3, and maybe I want V3 to be negative two, zero. Do I want it to be that? Let's actually make it negative two, one. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> and we've seen now how we can, well, first add components, or first add vectors in, in R2 and look at them visually. What if I now want to apply the other operation from a vector, vector space, which is scalar multiplication? Well, that would just be taking this vector and multiplying it by a real number. So let's say that I want to scale this vector by two, the real number two. Then I would say that two V3 would just be two times this vector, negative two, one, like this. And we would just distribute the two into each of the components in the column. So that would make the top component negative four and the bottom component, positive two. So visually on the, this plane right here, we can say, all right, what, is, what does that look like, the act of scaling it? Well, if we were to first draw out V3, that would be two to the left and one upwards. So V3 by itself, and let me just erase this real quick, would be this arrow right here, this would be V3. If we were to then scale V3 by two, what that does visually is that takes this arrow and takes the size of it and doubles the size of it. So now the, the horizontal component is four, or four to the left, and the vertical component is up two. So maybe I'll just draw, um, let's see, how am I gonna do this? Uh, it's going to be over four and up two, like this. This longer arrow, the longer arrow is going to be two times V3. <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay. so, so this, I realize it's probably getting kind of messy as well. But hopefully we, the, the main idea is, is to understand that visually we can imagine scaling a vector by taking an arrow in space and scaling it by whatever the, the scale factor is. If this was one half, then we would take the size of this arrow and shrink it by a half. If this was 27, we take the size of this arrow, same direction, but make it 27 times its original size. Okay. Hopefully we can see how the, the algebra corresponds to the visual intuitive picture that we have right here. So, so this is how we can think of vector addition in our heads and, and as well as scalar multiplication in our heads. Now, uh, one more thing that I probably want to just mention before we dive into anything else uh, in, in future videos is the notion of something called a unit vector, okay? And a unit vector is uh, kind of like how the name suggests a vector of unit length, or a vector of length of one unit. So with each of these arrows in space, they're pointing in a direction and they have a certain length associated with them. If the length of this vector is one, we would call that a unit vector. Now we, we might say, okay, but well, how do we determine the, the length of a vector? And at least in R2, right? in this two-dimensional plane. And maybe let me just erase this real quickly to, to go through that, and then we'll probably call it for, the, for this video. But if we were to draw out 
sort of this 2D plane right here. And let's say that I, I, I have this vector 3, 1, so 3 to the right and then 1 up. V1 would look like this. And I want to determine the length of V1. Well, the, the length of V1 is the length of this, this uh, sort of diagonal pointing line, or, or arrow, I should say. And hopefully we remember from Pythagorean's theorem that if this is A, and if this is B, and if this is C, then we can find the length of this by, by saying that C is just the square root of A squared plus B squared, All right? So in other words, the length or the magnitude of the vector V1, which I can write like this, the magnitude or its length is simply going to be the sum of the squares of each of its components. So it's going to be three squared plus one squared, three squared plus one squared, which is nine plus one or the square root of 10. Okay. So we would say that V1 is not a unit vector because its length or its magnitude is not equal to one, it's equal to the square root of 10. But hopefully we could see that if the size of this arrow is 10, or sorry, the square root of 10, if we were to just scale this down by a factor of square root of 10, we would have like square root of 10 shrunk by square root of 10, we'd get back to one. We could produce a unit vector given any vector. So it turns out, and, and let me just do this right here, that if I have a vector v1, and then I divide it by its length, or its magnitude, like this, that will produce a unit vector. This will produce a unit vector. And there is a typical notation that we use to describe a unit vector. And to describe a unit vector, we'll write v1, but rather than denoting an arrow, like this, we're going to denote a little hat. Give it a little hat to say it's a unit vector. Like that. Okay. So this is the equation that we can use to determine any unit vector. We first find the length of a vector. We first write out the vector right here, and then divide it by its length. And and I want to make sure that what is being written here is is clear in terms of what's a vector and what's a scalar. Because v1 has the hat over it, so it's a vector. This v1 right here, it has a hat, so, so it is a unit vector, but it is also a vector. So we have a vector here and a vector here. And if we have a vector on one side, we have to have a vector on the other side. And we can't divide two vectors, so that tells us that this absolute magnitude of v1 needs to be a scalar. In other words, it needs to be a real number. Now, I might be saying, why, why does this need to be a real number if it, if it has the hat over it? And the reason is when we put the, the absolute magnitude sign around V1, this is the computation that, that we would do in order to get a real number out of this. We, we see that another way of writing V1 hat, the unit vector V1, another way of writing V1 hat is to take V1 and v1 is 3, 1. And to scale it by the scalar, 1 divided by this length. In other words, to scale it by the real number, 1 over the square root of 10. And then we just apply a standard scalar multiplication, and we get that the unit vector v1 is 3 over root 10, 1 over root 10, like this. So, so that is why we're not running into any contradictions with taking one vector and dividing it by another. This is really one vector multiplied by a scalar right here. So we're not disobeying the, the axioms of vector addition and scalar multiplication. Okay. So hopefully these ideas make sense. I know it's the first time that we're getting introduced to them. Just as a final summary, in terms of a definition for what a vector is, a vector is anything that can be added to another vector and, scale, and multiplied by a scalar. That's the definition. For our intuition, a vector can be thought of as an arrow in space that has both a length and a direction associated with it. Notice that those are very different though, and that we should make sure that 
thinking of a vector as an arrow in space, we should keep that separate from thinking of anything that can be added and multiplied by a scalar. Hopefully this makes sense. It is a little bit difficult for me to, to gauge if I'm going too fast, too slow, anything like that. But this is, I guess, the first actual video in, in linear algebra. In the next video, uh, just to give a little bit of prefix, I guess, um, notice that in, in the, the definition of, of what vectors are, we said that there are things that can be added to other vectors and multiplied by scalars, but we did not say that we can multiply two vectors by each other. We can only add two vectors. And if we were to multiply, it has to be a scalar and a vector, not a vector and a vector. But it turns out that there are these modified ways of effectively multiplying one vector by another. And there are these various types of things called vector products. And the next video is going to be spent uh, essentially going through a lot of different types of vector products. So um, I'm looking forward to that and, and hopefully you are as well. Uh, thanks so much and I will see you guys in the next video.